All right, y'all, welcome to the Scott Horton Show. I'm the director of the Libertarian Institute, editorial director of Antiwar.com, author of the book Fool's Errand, Time to End the War in Afghanistan, and the brand new Enough Already, Time to End the War on Terrorism. And I've recorded more than 5,500 interviews since 2003, almost all on foreign policy and all available for you at scotthorton.org. You can sign up for the podcast feed there. And the full interview archive is also available at youtube.com slash Scott Horton Show. Okay, guys, on the line, I've got Matt Taibbi again. Thank goodness. He is at racket.news and um, he's also at public. Dot, well, what the hell is it? They're going to call it public.substack.com um, for a couple of the important pieces we're going to be discussing today. He is, um, of course, formerly at Rolling Stone magazine and wrote a whole bunch of great books, including Hate Inc., all about the media that I know you'll really like. And he's been doing some campaign coverage lately, but boy, he's got a big one on Russiagate here. Welcome back to the show, Matt. How you doing? I'm doing great. How are you doing, Scott? I'm doing great. And by one, I meant series on Russiagate here. And um, you're sharing a byline. Introduce us to your byline sharers, if you would, please. Sure. It's Michael Schellenberger from Public uh, and his partner, uh, Alexander Gutentag, his writing partner, that is. Um, you know, Michael is one of the Twitter files reporter or reporters, and mm -hmm. we uh, testified together on the Hill. Right. OK, great. And now I love the headline. I knew you were going to get to this eventually. Untitled gate. I says, Matt, get back to work on that untitled gate, man. I need to know what happened at the beginning of this thing here. And of course, you're the one who's going to tell me. I knew it was true. And now here it's the future. And it came true. CIA uh, had, had foreign. Huh? Yeah. Wait, what? I forgot all about, <laughs> all about that. But yeah. Yeah. Right. No, nah, this is like the most important thing that never happened. Only now it did. Um, CIA had foreign allies spy on Trump team. Triggering Russia collusion hoax, sources say, and there's a couple more that we're going to talk about too, but this gets right to it. John Brennan, the leader of Jabhat al-Nusra, he's the one who got this whole ball rolling in the year 2015. Is that correct? Yes. Well, we've been told a couple of different versions of this story, so I should just give the background on what the story is. Um in 2017 and 2018, the House Intelligence Committee was run by a Republican. Is this okay if I do this? Because it, it's the not going to make sense. Otherwise. Of course, dude. The floor is yours. Uh, absolutely. Yeah. So, you know, it's early 2017. Trump has just become president. The world's losing its mind over Russiagate, if you remember. And the, um, the House Intelligence Committee at the time... Uh, the Republicans were in control of the House, and it was the chairman was a California congressman named Devin Nunes, and he started a an investigation in the Permanent Select Committee on Investigations, which in D.C. is nicknamed HIPSI, um, and they they worked on this for two solid years, and only a portion of that research ever got out. Uh, you might be familiar with the Nunes memo or the Nunes memo, mm -hmm. which um, alleged abuses of the FISA intelligence process. Uh, there was a lot of controversy. And then finally, it turned out to be true after an inspector general report. So the story that we got, every a lot of people heard the same basic story six years ago, that what these what that team had um, was evidence of a kind of a broad espionage campaign and among other things and uh it, it's sort of a manufactured intelligence story similar to the wmd scandal and but we just couldn't report it because we didn't it's all classified and it, it's been blocked and finally some of it trickled out so we had enough sources who could only re uh, from recollections um recall the research and reports uh that that was that were done but when we finally got enough to coincide we were able to report certain things like for instance that there were 26 trump associates uh who were placed under surveillance beginning either in late 2015 or early 2016 depending on who you talk to 
uh, certainly by March of 2016, it was starting. Mm -hmm. And then, but in other words, then it's completely clear now, as although anyone could have assumed that Miss Foot and the entire Papadopoulos thing that set up originated with this same operation for one. Is that correct? Yes, yes. And and one, one of the things that was told to us kind of offhandedly, and this, this is one of the things that happens in journalism every now and then where, where somebody's talking to you and, and they think they're telling you something really important about one thing and they kind of casually drop something else that blows your mind. Uh, they, they were talking about how basically – they couldn't find anything that w was like concrete evidence of real interactions with Russians between, uh, you know, tr with Trump's team. And they, and they casually dropped the news that, yeah, we find that they were talking to this Maltese professor who turned out to be an MI6 agent. <laughs> and so that they're, they're referring obviously to Joseph Mifsa, the, the uh, Maltese professor who, ostensibly is the beginning of this whole story mm -hmm. um but you know it, it's been speculated that he's been a foreign agent and we still can't prove it but that's something that's in a report somewhere in a vault in langley let's yeah. just put it that way well yeah that's one more source for sure and you know in my book i say well if anything the guy must be mi6 if you look at how close he is to these various people and the various things he was involved in um right Right. I mean, and he's disappeared since that time. Um, although we, you know, we, we have, we have some interesting information about where he might be. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, the, the idea that he was, you know, you know, some kind of a Russian cutout was never terribly meaningful, mm -hmm. uh, or, you know, convincing. Okay. Even but so to rewind a step here, you're saying mm -hmm. that this house committee had all this information, and you've known a bit of this, but now you got enough of it that you can stand on it and really report it out, that before, say, for example, the Guardian story says that, oh, GCHQ overheard something in 2015, that this was before that, that even that would have been probably like parallel construction or at least maybe kind of a limited hangout explanation leaked to the Guardian after the fact but still saying that this thing began not with Miss Foot the spy blabbing to Papadopoulos, who then blabbed to Downer, the Australian diplomat, and that got around to the FBI in July, but that this started way before that, and they were the ones who had sick Miss Foot on poor Papadopoulos in the first place. And then I guess that raised all kinds of questions about how he was sent there by his friends in the first place to go to Rome, uh, to this Italian spy training school, cut out weird thing where he was, where they had this conversation in the first place. Right. Right. And then he was offered, you know, some money to write a paper and all this other crazy stuff. But I, I think what you, when you described, um, you know, the situation with that explanation about GCHQ, um, you know, the stories that came out in the guardian and, and, uh, the New Yorker, I, I tend toward the second explanation that, that, that this is kind of an after the fact, uh, reconstruction, like a pre bunking, uh, type of situation, because we, we were told sort of the exact opposite that, um, in, instead of what those stories say, which is that, uh, the British intercepted what they called a stream of illicit communications, um and you know notified us uh that it was actually the other way around that you know we contacted them and 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 that was the predicate for this whole thing mm -hmm. we you mean cia contacted the cia the yeah, yeah exactly this the, the cia it, it was at the behest of the cia and the american intelligence community mm -hmm. that requests went out we were told to multiple uh, foreign allies to engage in various types of surveillance and what they call bumping, right? So that's when you have um, an informant kind of run into somebody, like literally in the, it can happen in a stairwell, you, you bump into somebody, or you set up a meeting of some kind, you offer something or other, 
um, you know, a job. And, you know, that describes what happened to Papadopoulos pretty well. Uh, and all of that stuff started to take place uh, well before the FBI investigation. So this this kind of explains, um, you know, certain things like, what, you know, why why was why was George Papadopoulos already already wrapped up in all this bizarre activity, um, having come from uh, the the Ben Carson campaign uh, way before the FBI started its investigation? It doesn't make sense unless they were looking. Somebody was looking at him beforehand, mm-hmm. and that's what we were told. Mm-hmm. And now twenty six targets. So beyond Papadopoulos, we can presume, or you know for sure, that that does mean Carter Page and or Mike Flynn as well. Yeah, well, so the people that we can confirm absolutely are the, you know, the five FBI targets. So that's Carter Page, uh, Papadopoulos, Michael Flynn, Paul Manafort, and uh, this gentleman named Walid Faris, who um, his his FBI code name was Crossfire Wind. Uh, There's also uh, Sam Clovis. We know that he was um, he was approached by. Uh, an FBI, the informant Stefan Halper, uh-huh. um, and there's a few others who are a little bit surprising who are on this list. Uh, you know, Chris Christie was actually monitored, I think, kind of accidentally, but it happened. There, there was a uh, a briefing of the Trump campaign. We didn't even put this in the story, uh, but there was a briefing of the Trump campaign where normally. Uh, you know, a major party candidate is sort of briefed on possible national security issues before the election, just so they can hit the ground running. Uh, instead of doing that normal briefing, they had an FBI agent sit in and spy on the three members of the Trump team and record their observations and comments in case uh, any of them said anything incriminating about Russia. And it was Trump Flynn and Chris Christie. So we know they they were also um, part of the surveillance. Wow. Um, And, you know, I guess we could go back to something that you point out in paragraph two of y'all's piece here that this is completely illegal. Who the hell do they think they are? Framing up, bumping into a major party candidate for president of the United States. He was by then by far the presumed front runner. Might as well have already been the nominee by then. And oh, right. Yeah. They're the secret no, I, police with no authority to do such a thing whatsoever. Absolutely. I mean, the, the implications of this are are completely crazy. Um, they've always justified this on the grounds that, well, they had something. They had something to go on. They had reasonable suspicion. Um, all those stories you mentioned, right? Like one of them, I think, was called. Um, you know, the the British had the story for, oh, the British spies were first to spot Trump's team, uh, Trump team's links with Russia. They all suggested that there was, you know, they were capturing something nefarious that justified all this activity, but they never told us what the nefarious thing was, which should have been a huge red flag for all the reporters who covered this. And now it turns out that uh, th- there was no national security justification. We were told point blank, uh, by the investigators or by the people or sort of around this team um, that there there was no national security reason. This had nothing to do with our relationship with Russia. This was all about just taking advantage of uh, politically inexperienced, quote unquote, rookie uh, Trump team uh, be, because these were people who might not have seen this kind of thing coming. Uh, I think that was one of the major things that we got was was this whole idea that this was not um, you know, a, a failed, mishandled national security investigation. It was something that was political from the start. Yeah, absolutely. All right. So um, let me change the subject a little bit back to some previous journalism that you mm-hmm. publish at your site. It's the story of this guy, Stephen Strange or Strange. Sorry. Strange. Right. Yeah. Mm-hmm. yeah. Um, and so he told the story that now you know, is consistent with this and fits a little better about how he had invited Paige. No hard feelings, no ill intent implied or intended there. But then what happened was Richard Dearlove of the Downing Street Memo showed up and talked with Halper. And all of a sudden Halper went over and started 
talking to Paige. So the implication being that Dear Love had told Halper, hey, that Paige guy works for Trump. You should go and nail him. And so then that's exactly what he did. And this was the starting, uh, you know, the beginning of the framing of Carter Page. And so then does that fit with the rest of what you've learned here too? Absolutely, yeah. I mean, I think that that story that we did, I think it was in 2019. Um, 20. Steve uh, did, he he worked, uh, he was in Cambridge. Uh, Stefan Halper was a Cambridge University uh, professor and Schrag sort of worked worked under him, and uh, yeah, uh, he he listened to to Halper talk constantly. He eventually got him on tape saying all kinds of crazy things. But the the key thing that you're talking about is that you know Halper ran into Page um, at a conference uh, in July of 2016. This is before the FBI, the start of the FBI investigation. And that scene that you describe, um, it, you know, where Dear Love is sort of pointing out Paige, it it strongly suggests that something was up before J- July 31st, right? Like all the paper on Helper is kind of post July 31st. It's kind of front dated, but that story by Schrag uh, definitely suggests that something was up before then, and that fits with all the other stuff that we know about, you know, Papadopoulos being run into, you know, by various characters. So, mm-hmm. absolutely. Mm-hmm. Hey, y'all! I got a new coffee sponsor, Mundo's Artisan Coffee at mundosartisancoffee.com. When I wake up in the morning, I feel like my brain is all dried out. I need to pour a hot mug of rich, tasty coffee all over it to get it back working again, like 10W30 for the noggin. Though not necessary, it helps if the coffee tastes good. Well, Mundo's Artisan Coffee does taste good. They get the best beans from all around the world, and they don't burn them. Support the show and support your brain at mundosartisancoffee.com. Just click the link at the right margin at scotthorton.org. Hey, guys. I have some wasps in my house, so I shot them to death with my trusty Bug Assault 3.0 model with the improved salt reservoir and bar safety. I don't have a deal with them. But the show does earn a kickback every time you get a bug of salt or anything else you buy from Amazon.com by way of the link in the right-hand margin on the front page at scotthorton.org. So keep that in mind. And don't worry about the mess. Your wife will clean it up. Well, folks, sad to say, they lied us into war. All of them. World War I, World War II, Korea, Vietnam, Iraq War I, Serbia, Afghanistan, Iraq War II, Libya, Syria, Yemen all of them. But now you can get the ebook All the War Lies by me for free. Just sign up for the email list at the bottom of the page at scotthorton.org or go to scotthorton.org slash subscribe. Get All the War Lies by me for free. And then you'll never have to believe them again. And yeah, it's funny because I got two windows open. One of them to your great new journalism and then the other to my book that has all this stuff I've collected, including a lot of your great journalism over the years on this subject. And so I got all my footnotes here and everything. I'm paging around. What was that guy's last name again? But um, so Oh, see, so, he, so you, you're, complete, you're obsessed with this thing too, right? Oh, uh, uh, yeah. No, I'm out of my mind. I mean, I don't know what I'd do without you, pal. But yeah, I mean, it's <laughs> it's a, to me, it's like Waco or something. I'm not getting over it. Uh, it's like lying us into a rock war too. It's it's unbelievable what they did. And I'm not a Trump guy. I've never been any more than you are. But just I don't care if they had done this to Hillary Clinton. I would have took her side against the secret police. You know what I mean? This whole thing is completely crazy. And and so speaking of which was um, I was going to say I have here in front of me was Steele's main source, Igor Danchenko, later Mm. told the FBI that he got Carter Page's name from Halper. So Halper oh, then, after that. framing That's the guy wild. up, then went and told the source for the Steele dossier, hey, you got to get some stuff on this page guy in there. Wow. And that's, See, no, that's that's fascinating, right? Yeah, uh, and that's from the um, FBI interview uh, of Danchenko. Hmm. I'm going to look so, that up right now. Okay, excellent. Yeah, dude. Um, here. No, because that, the, the, that that's another thing. We had a, We had a little bit of you know, back and forth about what the relationship was between all this surveillance and the Steele dossier. And, you know, they were sort of suggesting, as opposed to the campaign driving the surveillance, which is what I think a lot of us thought, um, 
it might have been the other way around. Uh, you, the the CIA did not have this direction about Russia initially. Um, they were looking in all directions. They were monitoring conversations between uh, Trump officials and people all over the world, including people like Mohammed bin Salman. Uh, and you you see that reflected in the Steele reports, like the early ones. Um, you know, they're not about Russia; they're about like Central Asia and hotels and stuff like that. And then, then they coalesce around the Russia theme uh, later. And so it's it would be interesting to know exactly, you know, when that decision was made, but and who did it. But uh, the, the idea that they were communicating like that is fascinating. Yeah, absolutely. Now, so you have a sort of a side piece here about the CIA is hiding these documents. This is a side story to the story. How you know all this stuff is because. The CIA, they implicate themselves in these giant reports like they did with their own secret side torture report that accidentally, possibly accidentally on purpose, got leaked to the Senate Intelligence Committee before. Um, They have the truth. And so somebody got a hold of it or at least knows that it exists and um, they thought they could hold on to it. So, oops. But um it, I guess it got out and disappeared again or some kind of complicated thing. Help me out. So this story is, this is hard. Okay. So here's the, the one thing that we know absolutely for sure is that there is a short completed finished um, report about the origins of the uh, intelligence community assessment that is done. It's about somewhere between 17 and 20 pages along. And it's supposedly on the grounds of Langley has never left uh and is in a vault um there are there are uh, more materials that they've been characterized as one binder um or three binders my suspicion is from talking from talking to all these different people is that we're talking about three different packets that collectively are 10 inches thick because we had somebody describe a 10 inch binder binder and that just it's just hard to imagine uh, that actually existing i don't think they even make those so um but the, the idea behind this is that uh donald trump absolutely for for sure ordered a huge stack of materials decl- declassified in the waning hours of his presidency uh this order was then sent to the intelligence community to do basically sort of a logistical uh, process of redaction and you know, there's a check they have to go through and they never approved it. And so even though legally the stuff is declassified when the president orders it, it remains secret. Um, there is a small packet of about 46 pages that did get out and that stuff is really interesting. Uh, I'm sure you've seen it, but there's a gigantic uh, you know, sort of mound of stuff uh, that is still out there and still and still declassified. And I'm sorry, I'm still classified. And we we need to see what's in that stuff. Yeah, for sure. Okay, and now, um, well, I'm afraid to move on to this other piece. If there's anything left on the original story here about the start of this thing and Brennan's role in getting this thing going in 2015 or early 2016 that I missed should ask you about anything on your mind there before we move on? Um, well, I mean, we, we can, we can come back to it. Let's go, let's go to the other thing. I'll, let me, let me call up the original interviews and and make sure that I've got everything because, uh, yeah, um, I mean, we, this this next piece is the one that I spent the most time on. If you're going to, if you're going to talk about the ICA. Yeah. um, So, I mean, this is huge. So for people to remember back, Trump's president elect and it's January. He's about to be sworn in. It's what, um, remind me, was it January 17th that they put it out three days before the inauguration? It was January 6th, believe it or not. Oh, okay. I'm sorry. Was, yeah. It was the same day. Coincidentally, the same date, um, as the, the Capitol riots just earlier. <laughs> right. Yeah. So yeah, this is January 6th, 2000, uh, 2017. And, they put out this thing, this intelligence community assessment, and it was, you know, I think a game changing document that uh, the main the main conclusion of it 
was that um, Vladimir Putin had ordered a, a what they call a, a, an influence campaign um, in order to denigrate Hillary Clinton and help President-elect Trump's electoral chances. And the thing about this is that the, at, without this ICA, and if you've read this thing, right? Um, oh, it's, yeah. it, if you actually read the document, most people will read it and say, wow, I'm, I, there must have been something else, right? Because yeah. it's just a gigantic catalog of like, well, we watched RT and there were these reports that were kind of like yeah. unflattering to the United States. Well, and in fact, I think what they did was they took a 12 page report about yeah, essentially whining about RT from years before and just stapled it onto the end like a high school kid would do to just pad the thing. And then, but meanwhile, there's actually nothing of substance in there. And, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And, and isn't that funny? Because the, that, that's exactly what happened with the WMD thing. They actually did take a, a, a kid's um, college report Mm -hmm. <laughs> the, the British did uh, and turned that into one of their intelligence assessments, the so-called dodgy do the dossier back then. Uh, mm -hmm. But this one, you know, uh, they, they wrote this really um, oft quoted sentence. We assess Putin and the Russian government aspired to help President elect Trump's election chances when possible by discrediting Hillary Cl uh, Secretary Clinton. Um, Russia's goals were to undermine faith in the process in de U.S. democratic process. Uh, denigrate Secretary Clinton and harm her elect, uh, electability. Uh, we further assess that Putin and the Russian government d developed a clear preference for President-elect Trump. Now, the reason this is important is because this is, it, it ends up kind of serving as the, the trigger for a whole series of events uh, that come afterwards, including the opening of uh, you know, the, the Mueller investigation. Mm -hmm. The Mueller investigation technically was was the continuation of the Crossfire Hurricane probe, but that had basically already wrapped up by this point. Mm -hmm. um, it was just the public furor that ensued after the release of this report, um, which also contained an annex uh, that was not visible to the public with the Steele dossier stuff in there right. uh, that leaked out. And um, so this report was critical, and the idea that Russia conducted an influence campaign, I, have, I keep having to say that because they never use the word interfere. This is an important detail. Hmm. Um, the interference, the National Intelligence Council uh, later defined it as, you know, meddling with the, the technical aspects of voting. So ballot boxes, uh, voter registration, stuff like that. So they couldn't say interference. All they could talk about was an influence campaign. But journalists added that word themselves. Right. And so, even the, even the mm -hmm. influence campaign was made up. But still, and look, at the time we covered it on the show, and uh, this jumped right out at us. We were making fun of this at the time. It says right in the ICA, it says, judgments are not intended to imply that we have proof that shows something to be a fact. <laughs> right. Okay. Right. Exactly. So we might be bluffing. Says right there in the thing. So okay. Yeah. Good enough for right. me to not believe any of it. <laughs> right there, you know, and tell you I mean, themselves how, not to believe it. How how embarrassing is that, right? I mean, it, it, you know, th these are people who lie for a living, and they can't even, um, you know, they 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 can't even come up with something uh, better than that. Seriously. But still, and look, and by the way, I, I saw that today you put out a thing where you gave credit to a bunch of people who got things right. And first on your list was Ray McGovern, who's the former chief of the chief analyst of the CIA Soviet division uh, back in the Cold War days. Well, the last Cold War days. And he was very good on this very point in real time back then because he is one of my go to guys. I have him on the show all the time back then. And he said, listen, I guarantee you that the Russians would prefer Hillary Clinton because Trump is a wingnut and is hard to quantify, whereas she is completely predictable. And they value that above anything else, that they know exactly what, how to measure what she will do. Whereas with Trump, he's kind of a loose cannon and nobody really knows. He could flip-flop back and forth and leave them stuck in a tougher situation, whatever, whatever. He just surmised that way back then from the very beginning.
you know, as soon as this story came out, he's like, let me tell you something. Guarantee you they prefer Hillary to this guy. Well, that is fascinating because that's almost word for word what we got, you know, from from this uh, from these sources. Uh, they were looking at this. And I'm just going to read this to you. Um, this, this is a quote. They cooked the intelligence to make it look like Putin supported Trump. The evidence points the other way. They saw Hillary as a manageable as manageable and reflecting continuity. It was a relationship they were comfortable with. Um, all of those leaks from that Brennan report and the IC conclusion were false. Uh, the key were the things they did to cook the intelligence and to build a false narrative. And it talked about how they left out uh, lots of negative information that they had about Russia's attitude towards Trump, that they thought he was unreliable, uh, mercurial, not steady. I'm sure there were things worse than that in there, but, um, but you know, at least, at least those d details were out there. So mm -hmm. that, that's exactly what Ray was saying, right? Yep, that's uh, exactly right. And so you're telling me, though, that when Brennan took his hand-picked team, that they just buried all of that, and trumped up what the rest saying what what do they even have saying that Russia supported Trump to bump up i think there's a quote in there somewhere where the house investigators say that they tried to find what the cia team was citing in order to support their claims and then they just couldn't find the yeah, they, evidence they, to support they, it at all it's sort of like it was for the rest of us. I mean, they, they had access to much better uh, inv information, but they never found the source of the Nile there. Um, we know a little bit, right? Like there, there was a, there, there's a fascinating thing that they, that they told us about where they talk about how there were three or four instances in the, in the report where they looked to see if there was a credible reporting line for the source and they couldn't find any history at all. Uh, so, you know, which, which suggests that they, there may have been just straight up invented material in the, in the report, mm -hmm. but all the same, it comes down to, and, and you, and you talked about the handpicked nature of the, of the team that wrote this report, mm -hmm. uh, and that's different from Iraq, uh, in, in a couple of ways, right? Iraq was a national intelligence estimate, which is a formal thing where every single intelligence agency gets a, um, a hand in having an opinion what they did with iraq is they just uh classified all the the negative information right where people said things like there's no operational tie between saddam and al-qaeda they just hid that from the public it's in the report but they hid it here what they did is they just kept everybody who had a different opinion out of the analytic process uh your friend ray uh you know he's the one he, he's one of the people who talked about um how the state department had a, had a different opinion and so the state department's intelligence service the inr was just kept out uh so uh when you get down to it uh, brennan even overruled a couple of his own russia experts uh that he had brought in to do this work and mm -hmm. ultimately it was publicly reported and there were a number of stories that that kind of talked about this is a big dramatic spy escapade but there was a single human source who was apparently quote unquote instrumental in this conclusion. Uh, and that was this alleged exfiltrated spy uh, about whom there was a big, you know, brouhaha mm -hmm. a couple of years ago. Guy's name was Oleg Smolenkov. He was a mid level diplomat who was supposedly, he supposedly had access to the desk of Vladimir Putin. But, uh, you know, there have been subsequent events that suggest that this guy is not any kind of spy at all. And, um, you know, it, it's clearly the FBI, the NSA, and at least a couple of Brennan's own CIA experts were not convinced by this intelligence. Uh, so, you know, what we were told, which is that they upgraded unreliable sources and downgraded reliable ones mm -hmm. that fits with the public story uh that we that we've learned over the years yep and in fact it was a big fake talking point that hey all 17 intelligence agencies meaning the national intelligence council they all are unanimous in this and they pushed that even though it was known from the beginning as we just talked about they published this dang thing in january anyone could read it they didn't pretend 
in the document that it was a national intelligence estimate. It was just that was what Hillary Clinton kept saying and the rest of the media kept repeating about it. But it was important. I forgot my source for this, but it's probably easy to find somewhere. It might even be you that there's a thing in the CIA called Russia House which is all their Russia experts. Who, that's all they do is sit around reading things in Cyrillic all damn day. And they weren't included. <laughs> they had nothing to do with this thing at all. That ought to tell you everything you need to know. If the fact that it was John Brennan, the leader of Jabhat al-Nusra in Syria, you know, involved wasn't enough. But uh, that's no, a right. And, 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 and in fact, that... The story that you just described is like one of the most amazing media stories of, of recent memory. The the 17 agencies thing it came out. It's it first came out in de, in the debate with uh, Donald Trump. Hillary brought it up. Uh, she talked about all 17 agencies and you know, say that Russia is interfering with the election. Uh, then about a year later, maybe eight nine months later, there were corrections in, by the AP and the New York Times. Uh, and they quietly said, yeah, it wasn't uh, 17 agencies. It was actually four. Then it turned, then there was some testimony by James Clapper, who was the head of the, um, you know, he was the director of national intelligence. And he said it was three um, and, and him, right? The, the director of national intelligence is an umbrella agency. To, so he wasn't counting his own agency because they didn't do any analytic work. Um, but what was fascinating was that when fact checkers looked back at that, like PolitiFact has a thing that says this wasn't a mistake because the ODNI speaks for all 17 agencies. Therefore, if James Clapper is involved, it's not wrong to say that all 17 agencies contributed to the report. <laughs> and that's, that's actually still out there. So that's why there's so many of these stories out there that are not corrected because they've used this ridiculous explanation. Yeah. Hey, it's like the due process for killing Alaki and his boy. Well, we talked about it in the White House. That's a due yeah. process. Was yeah, a process due, due that process you do. doesn't have to involve an, the, the, the defendant. Right. Or, you know, a judiciary or even an administrative court. What the hell? We just we're sitting on the couch shooting the shit. Um, also important, poor reality winner got herself sent to prison. Well... With the help of Matthew Cole, the great betrayer of sources, um, and uh, all to leak a document that said that the NSA didn't really stand by the CIA and FBI's claims here. They give mm -hmm. it a green line, but NSA only gives it a yellow, which means this doesn't come from us who are, you know, the knowers of all things digital on the planet, the omniscient god of the fiber optic cable, National Security Agency. This ain't coming from us, but we don't want to be rude and contradict the CIA and the FBI if they say they're sure, so here's our yellow line. And that should have told everybody all you need to know right there, you know? Right. The fact that the NSA wouldn't sign off is a big deal. Brennan talked about it in his book. Um, there's a passage in there in his book, Undaunted. I mean, God, it's a horrible, t it's a horrible book, but, it, but, uh, he, he talks about being disappointed in Admiral Mike Rogers, who ran the NSA back then, uh, that Rogers, and then, then he had two Russia experts from the CIA who wouldn't go along. And his, his decision was to overrule because they hadn't seen all the intelligence, but not just the NSA. There's another subplot involving the FBI. Um, the reporter Jeff Gerth, who wrote the Columbia Journalism Review uh, opus about all the reporting errors in uh, in Russiagate, he's the only person I think who who noticed this. But the FBI publicly changed their mind on this issue uh, right before the election. They said that um, you know the hack of the DNC was not done specifically to help Trump, and that they, whatever Russia was doing was was just to sow discord. Uh, not for any particular candidate. And then uh, in the middle of December, they came out publicly and said, yeah, we're now going to back the CIA's position on this. And Comey, when he testified, said that we didn't come to that conclusion until December. So up until the election, they didn't believe it either, which should tell you something. Yeah. And they were the ones doing the line. Sometimes it's right. hard to send the memo around when everybody's just whispering what we're supposed to believe here.
Right, right, exactly. It's, it's just crazy. It is. Hey, y'all, Scott here. Let me tell you about Roberts and Roberts Brokerage, Inc. Who knew? Artificial bank credit expansion leads to price inflation and terribly distorted markets. If you've got any savings left at all, you need to protect them. You need to put some, at least, into precious metals. Well, Roberts and Roberts can set you up with the best deals on silver, gold, platinum, and palladium. And they've been doing this since 1977. Hey, if you just need some sound advice about sound money, they're there for you too. Call Tim Fry and the guys at 800-874-9760. That's 800-874-9760. Or check them out at rrbi.co. That's rrbi.co. You'll be glad you did. Hey, y'all, you should sign up for my Substack. It's scotthortonshow.substack.com. And if you do that, you'll get the interviews a day before everybody else. But not only that, they'll be free of commercials. How do you like that? Pretty good, huh? scotthortonshow.substack.com. Hey, y'all, libertasbella.com is where you get Scott Horton Show and Libertarian Institute shirts, sweatshirts, mugs, and stickers and things, including the great Top Lobsters designs as well. See, that way it says on your shirt why you're so smart. Libertas Bella, from the same great folks who bring you ammo.com for all your ammunition needs, too. That's libertasbella.com. Um, you know, we got to bring up here, I think, and talk about the role of Gina Haspel here. Because one, I don't know that much about it. But two, also, I like to just clown on Trump that how lazy is this guy that he's the president of the United States of America and he's appointing his deadly enemy to be the head of the CIA in the middle of all of this going on. And he has no idea who she is or why there might be a conflict of interest here at all. I guess it didn't occur to him at all to try to find a loyalist somewhere with the credentials to put in place there. But no. Well, Right. Yeah. I mean, Gina Haspel is smack dab in the middle of this whole story. She was station chief of the CIA in London when this was all happening, which means that this whole thing couldn't have happened without her say so. Because when the FBI wanted to go to England and launch their crossfire hurricane uh, investigation, they needed the permission of the British government. You have to make overtures to the intelligence community that has to be done from another intelligence agency, which means that the CIA station chief in England had to negotiate that deal. So she was in the middle of this. Uh, she was also in the middle of the moment when an Australian diplomat named Alexander Downer allegedly walked in off the street with information about George Papadopoulos talking about the Russians having dirt on Hillary Clinton. Uh, you know, that's a highly malodorous story. So she's she's a character in this story. Uh, and yet when this uh, House Intelligence Committee uh, group put together this report, she continually blocked its release. And, you know, that's one consistent thing we heard from multiple sources around around this whole thing, w w which is that Gina wouldn't let it out. And, you know, Trump was trying to declassify this and his own handpicked CIA head is the one that uh, didn't let it happen. Also, I just want to, I'm not sure if you remember the story, but do you remember after the Sergei Skripal thing um, took place, there was a crazy story in the New York Times about how Gina Haspel was showing Do uh, Donald Trump pictures of dead ducks uh -huh. implying that Russian poison was was killing all these animals in the area in England and they were fake. The, the pictures were fake. And, and they didn't show that even to, you know, they didn't have Bellingcat put that out on Twitter. And they, they only use that on Trump. Like he's the biggest sucker of all. Just show him some dead ducks. Right. Yeah. It, it, it was, it was fake news just for him. Right. It's and amazing. it was done by, by his own CIA head. And that came out publicly. Uh, and, and he's, you know, Look, I think there's a lot of there's a lot of evidence that the Trump team, for all uh, whatever else is going on, they just were blindsided by this whole thing. They they're, they weren't experienced. They hesitated to strike back quickly at the beginning because I think they were unsure. You know, I had one person say to me like, "We didn't know. Maybe somebody had a meeting somewhere, right?" Mm -hmm. um, so, well, you know, 
I don't know. If, I don't know if you remember this footnote, but you need it just in case somewhere. I think it's really important. I got it from Bob Woodward's book and nowhere else. And we only found it out years later. And I'm sorry, I forget which book. They all have one word titles, you know, but I'm sure everybody could find yeah. it. Um, right. But what it is, is it's Trump's lawyer, Dowd. As soon as Trump becomes president, Dowd says to Trump, listen, man, come on. It's me. I'm your lawyer. It's just us here. Tell me, did you do this? And Trump says, hell no, I didn't do a thing, blah, blah, blah. And he goes, all right, well, here's what I want to do. I want to take every scrap of paper from the campaign. I want to turn it all over to the special counsel right now. So I guess this would have been right after Mueller was named. And then Mueller's right-hand guy is this guy, is it Andrew Feinberg? Weissman. Weissman, sorry. Um, And he says, Trump says, go ahead. So they take every scrap of paper. They don't sift anything. They just take the whole pile oh, and yeah. they give it to Mueller's aide. And he says, and Dowd says, listen, we're being decent and fair and upfront with you. We hope that you'll treat us with mutual respect here and we'll like, you know, do this thing fairly. So come on. This is a gesture of goodwill on our part. Here's everything we got because we know how innocent we are. And then. They just continue to screw him for another two years straight after that. They pretend to investigate for another two years straight after that. Well, and that's that's a crazy story. And you know what's frustrating about that is that there there are all these legends about Donald Trump, the anti democratic menace, and you know he's going to do all of these terrible things. It, it, it would have been probably legal. For him to send, you know, SWAT teams rappelling through the windows of all the, the people involved in this whole thing, um, and have and have them whisked away to you know supermax prisons in Florence, Colorado, or, or whatever it is, and at the very least, you know, when the the first stories about the P tape leaked out, he should have hauled those four intelligence chiefs uh, in for a meeting and said, you know, you guys have. 20 minutes to explain this or else you're all gone. Uh, but they didn't do that, you know, um, because they, uh, they just didn't know what to do. I mean, I, I, they, this is, they're not experienced at this game. I mean, of course I'm not either, but, uh, I think a lot of, uh, you know, George HW Bush wouldn't have been fooled by this thing. Right. I mean, yeah. the head of the former head of the CIA. So yeah, that, the, there's an element of not knowing what these people are capable of, which is important here. Yeah. Well, and look, I mean, out here in the peanut gallery, we knew what to do, which was at the very least, they should have been keeping up to date on Taibi and Mate, right? Because. <laughs> and you, of course. And and look, I mean, whatever. I, they ain't got to listen to my show. But I mean, hey, David Stockman, he's a good capitalist, former Reagan advisor. He was killing it on this day in and day out for years. Oh, I didn't realize and, that. Was oh, it? yeah. And uh, best of the best, Sheldon Richman at uh, the Libertarian Institute and, and lots of people. Um, but the real thing is more important than that is the, and the most important, probably for Trump's purposes, would have been to highlight Aaron Maté in the Nation magazine. That mm-hmm. should have been all capital letters on his Twitter feed. Hey, everybody, look, even the liberals admit that I'm not guilty. And then but he didn't even have the wherewithal to do that, to keep up with. There's a, a group of and throw in Gareth Porter and, of course, Ray McGovern and others. All these people who are on the left who are do not favor Trump. But they also do not favor lies coming out of the FBI and the CIA either. And they're just debunking this story because it's not true. That should have been the Trump people's highest priority at the very least would have been to trumpet all of the work proving their innocence coming from the left. And they didn't even do that once. And they didn't have the wherewithal to even do that at all. You would think that that guy, Stephen Miller, somebody would have come up. Someone would have had an intern collect all the best. I mean, hell, never you mind Chuck Ross and all the guys on the right doing great work, right? right. But like mm-hmm. from a culture jamming point of view, you want to cite the liberals. That's even better, right? But like they didn't even cite Chuck Ross. They just weren't even on it at all. Well, I mean, you make a, a really good point. And I think, by the way, that's probably the reason that, you know, Aaron was squeezed out of the nation and democracy now. And Glenn ended up, Glenn Greenwald ended up kind of squeezed out of 
the intercept, even which he had found it. I, I, you know, I wasn't fired, but it was uncomfortable. And, you know, the writing was on the wall at Rolling Stone. Mm -hmm. I think because all these organizations knew that it was political, um, you know, it was, it was radioactive to have anybody uh, in a mainstream organization talking about how, how phony this whole thing was, which is why you see what's happened to people like Barry Meyer, right? Who is a, you know, very respected New York times reporter. He wrote a book about steel and now, you know, now he's persona non grata in, in that hmm. world. So I didn't um, know that one. Yeah, no, yeah. I mean, it's, uh, it, it, it I don't, it's, it's not an accident that there's nobody left in mainstream media who, who talks about this. Yeah. Hey, and as long as uh, we're daydreaming about how this could have gone different, another one is, and this is something that Ray suggested right away to, is that Trump should have given a speech on the order of like the Saturday night massacre situation and said, look, the special counsel and all of his men and the top 25 guys at the FBI and the Department of Justice, you're all fired, all of you, and you're gone, and security, get them out the door right now, but, 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 I also hereby declassify everything that Justice and FBI and NSA and CIA have on me and my team, and I hereby order it to be copied in quadruplicate and delivered to the Washington Post and the New York Times and National Public Radio and the Wall Street Journal. And you sons of bitches do your worst. And so you can't impeach me until the reporting is done. But you go ahead and see what's there because I know how innocent I am, but I'm not going to let you ruin the whole damn presidency this way by bogging me down on these lies. Forget it. And that probably would have worked because what could they have said to that? Well, he did order the government to turn every scrap of paper over to us. Maybe we should take a look at it. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah. The, what, were they, what would they say? No. Right. I mean, yeah, exactly. Yeah, Sick they, Mara Liason and her team, they'll they'll find the treason in that stack of papers. You know, <laughs> let them go. Exactly. Exactly. Mm. No, that makes a lot of sense. They should have done that yep. for sure. And for and sure. McGovern recommended that in real time. You know what I mean? It would have oh. been outrageous, but then also would have been like, ah, then again, that makes sense at the same time too. You know what I mean? So Right, 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 right. Anyway. Absolutely. Um all right, so uh, one last thing before I let you go here, because I do have a minute before I have to. Um, this is a really important story that you wrote, too. Why even Democrats should care about the cooked intelligence Russiagate scandal. This is, in other words, all the reasons that you cared, even at the time. Not that you're a Democrat. You're a journalist, obviously, first. But you also wrote the book, Insane Clown President, about who Donald Trump is to you, which says a lot right there. So... You know, what's the larger principle at stake here that matters so much, you think? The, you know, the, both the Iraq episode uh, with the National Intelligence Estimate, when we didn't hear the truth for 12 years. I mean, they told us the parts that they wanted us to hear, uh, and then they left out all the derogatory information, and it wasn't declassified for 12, 12 years. You know, that that's basically what's happening now. It's, you know, they put out something phony and then it leaks out four or five, eight years later, whatever it is. Uh, it's too late at that point. Um, you know, ma manufactured intelligence, no matter what the subject is, it, it has a profound impact on politics because they can argue for almost any kind of action. And the public's attention span just isn't equal to the level of trickery that they're able to to bring out with this stuff the, so I, I think people need just need to bring a level of skepticism that's even degrees higher than you know it's been since 9 11 um and the wmd fiasco because uh, now we know that they're they, you know they'll lie openly in these things mm -hmm. and um we just got to be on the lookout for it yeah well i mean it's such an important cultural phenomenon the way that the left kind of joined forces with the liberals in rallying around the national security establishment because it's not even the FBI. We're talking about the national or the FBI's counterintelligence division and the CIA here. They're the ones kind of generating this thing. And then, but since Trump is the infection, then they're the antibodies. And so the left sides with the national security state against the elected president. 
in such a harsh way. And now it's taken, I guess, finally the war in Israel-Palestine to split the left away from the liberals again on, you know, whose side are you on on these things. But now here we go again. It's election years we're talking about right now. And, you know, we skipped, um, you know, we haven't talked about the, uh, you know, laptop gate, uh, you know, crisis there. But everybody listening to this knows that story anyway. So we have the national security state, the FBI and CIA intervene in the last two elections against Donald Trump. And they're virtually certain to this time. And then there's a real question then about what's this left and liberal sometimes alliance going to do with each other and with the rest of us in reaction to that, you know? Mm -hmm, mm Mm-hmm. Yeah, no, absolutely. Absolutely. That's true. Well, I guess we'll find out what they have in store for us this year, but uh, thanks a lot for your time, man. Really appreciate it, Matt. All right. Thanks a lot, Scott. And I hope to talk to you soon. Yep. All right, you guys, that's great. Matt Taibbi, he's at racket.news. And also uh, this series is uh, also at public.substack.com. The Scott Horton Show, Anti-War Radio, can be heard on KPFK 90.7 FM in L.A., APSRadio.com, Antiwar.com, ScottHorton.org, and LibertarianInstitute.org.